So last time we started uh, we started looking into more advanced multi-core uh, embedded systems and discussing some of the challenges. Uh, again, if you recall the story we have done, we looked into a very simple single processor, simple task model. We had a couple of lectures for scheduling with, with all their detail. Then we said, okay, all of this is in fact might be ignoring what if we have shared resources, right? And then uh, we start discussing if you have shared resources, we started by the same assumption that you have, even if you have a single processor, but there might be a sharing a data section or an idle. Then we said when it comes to multi-core, shared resources becomes much more and become they become also hardware shared. And we mentioned a few examples of these things. You need shared data connect, shared caches, shared memories, shared IOs. Then we said for multi-core architecture, especially, we need to handle them in a very special way. And we gave this motivational example that if you have a, a critical virtual machine, a non-critical virtual machine, virtual machine is just an isolated task, basically. A set of knowledge in the then we said, even if you are running in your own core, you might, your performance, well, your worst case execution time might be impacted by the other, what the other virtual machine is doing. Because, for example, you can invent your cache line in the shared cache. And hence, it turns your head into a mess. And we said, well, head access time may be two cycles. Miss access time is double hundred cycles until you go to the main memory, which means your execution time now as a critical task depends on the behavior of the critical task on meeting with you on this shared resource. Yeah? And then we discuss why we do all of this, why we care about real time available assessments, special scheduling. We said because we need for real time embedded systems, we need to come up with an estimate for the worst case execution plan, right? And this is what we started last lecture with. Uh, the OCT uh, methodology is like how to compute worst case execution time. We define what is worst case execution time. Then we said there are two main approaches to do this. One of them is static timing analysis, right? Which is, well, you take your program, you take a model of your hardware, then you run certain tools or you do formal analysis by hand, such that you cover all the possible paths. We said this is good because it's in fact verifiable. Like this is something that is by construction, a formal worst case execution time for safer. But we said, Beyond simple programs, this is very, very complex to do. Almost impossible. It's an MP hard job, right? For complex architectures and complex uh, real-time tasks. 
So the second methodology, does anyone remember what is the second methodology? So we say static time analysis. What is the other methodology that we can use to compute your space section time? Can anyone remember? No. So say the second one is the inventor, right? So uh, did you find it anyone? Yeah, that's the measurement base, right? That's the measurement base or the empirical based estimation of the worst case in What do I do? Instead of doing a formal analysis or using a formal analysis tool, I run my, I take my application or real time tasks or tasks, run them in the actual hardware, millions of times with different input cases, trying to cover all the most important cases, and then come up with the worst time. So it's an empirical approach, right? And I give you the example of this uh, Google car that has been in the streets for 10 years, right? They are trying to cover all the possible scenarios of the weather, of uh, road conditions, of traffic signs, of different laws. So you try to do, uh, well, actual data collection from the actual in-field running, and then you reason about these systems, right? You said, well, this is easy to do compared to static timing analysis. The problem is, what is the problem? Just even if you don't remember, say like, yeah. I guess it doesn't Yeah, by definition, I'm doing experiments. So if I do a million experiments, someone can come and say, well, there's a million and one experiment that you really ignore that gives you a higher expression, right? So usually, empirical methods are, are not considered formal proofs, right? This is a, this is a very big tool, like basically in engineering, there are two, you look into different fields, you find two big directions, right? One of them is the formal direction, like our folks in the CS department. They are experts in formal analysis. Uh, well, this is by construction, something to my life. You are really sure that basically I have covered all the cases because this is the proof. If you don't really trust the proof, then you have to assist it. But once you think that the proof is correct, well, whatever you proved is, you prove independent of whatever is the case or the scenario, right? And again, the problem with this is very, very hard to do for a real, a real setup, right? It might be good for a lab, it might be good for it's a paper, but not for something in industry that is very complex, similar to multiple avionics or healthcare. Uh, on the other hand, the second school, which is more like an engineering rather than a, a science approach, is let's really try exhaustively all the possible cases, right? If I, if I want to do all the possible cases, well, I have no problem. But the problem is there is no definition of all possible cases, right? Think about the car industry, it's an like infinite number of possibilities, right? Uh, but as far as you cover enough possibilities and you have a proof for this and you go to the certification authority, tell them, well, I have covered all these cases and then I have some sort of reason that these cases are enough. And on top of this, to make sure that even if I missed one case, I had a margin of safety. I told you that usually the margin of safety is 15% to 20%. Right? Then this gives you a worst case action time estimate, but with, well, a manageable approach. Good? Then we said, okay, besides these two cases, if I can do static timing analysis or empirical analysis of single tasks, what if I have multi tasks and multi pools running to me? Right now, your state space is the blues, right? Because it's not only about one task, about multiple tasks, multiple pools competing in the resources. And as we said that a couple of minutes ago, that your behavior as a critical task in a pool will depend on the behavior of other tasks from the other people. Will they compete with you on the shared resources? And we have given the dynamic for shared catch. And then they still ask to discuss, okay, how to handle shared resources? This is a big problem. If I want to adopt multi-core architectures in safety critical systems, I need to understand somehow, right? And we started by talking about the interconnect. We said, let's take a, a simple bus. And then we discussed that by a predictable arbiter that manages access to this bus, you can, in fact, reason about the risk behavior and then use it uh, as an added term to uh, calculate the optimal worst case decision time. And if you remember, just again to connect this to the bigger picture, we said our worst case execution time, originally in our simple task model, this only included worst case computation time, right? We see CT like worst case computation time. But then we said with shared resources, I can add an additional term. I say, if I run in isolation as a task, and then I suffer this worst case computation time, this does not account for interference for shared cache, for example, or shared interconnect. So what should I do? 
is I should add a term here, and this term will come from the worst case interference latency. And well, studying arbiters or using predictable arbiters will help me compute this worst case latency, right? And then we discuss few types of arbiters. We discuss TDM. And then, well, advantages, disadvantages, and then compute the worst case for TDM, then round robin, it's more dynamic advantages, disadvantages. And we discuss two different implementations of round robin or conserving TDM. And then we compare all of them. Uh, I guess this is the slide that I, I, I walk you through the example uh, by drawing. And then uh, we also discussed this. But so far we stopped here last time. So we said for these four examples, TDM or conserving TDM, round robin, whatever version you use, all of them are fair. Fair in the sense that you assume there is one slot per group, right? Well, that's good for fairness. But we said it's not good for requirement awareness. Not all tasks have the same criticality. Not all tasks have the same requirement, right? If I go back to the bigger picture, well, this worst case exchange time, at the end of the day, once you compute it, you have to make sure it's all the time less than or equal to the deadline of the task, right? But different tasks have different deadlines, which means they have different constraints on the worst case exchange time, which means they must have a different worst case latency in terms of arbiters, for example, right? So giving everyone the same risk latency might seem good in terms of fairness and simplicity, but it's not good in terms of meeting the requirements. And for this purpose, there is another type of arbiter, which is priority-based round robin. So in priority-based round robin, what we say is, well, if I have critical and non-critical tasks, what can I do is, well, prioritize the critical ones. All the time they have higher priority, which means they don't suffer any interference from the non-critical ones. And the non-critical ones, I don't give them any guarantees. They are supposed to be non-critical. And uh, well, if, if if I have an empty slot or if, like all the critical cores don't have something to send, I will use the non-critical core request. But if all the critical tasks have requests or all of them have a request, I just ignore the non-critical ones, right? So. The reason that they try to do this is try to address again this notion of criticality or priority based tasks. Some tasks are more important than other tasks. Uh, and as I well, write in here, schedule only the critical tasks, cores, and round robin. So instead of doing round robin for all the tools, so for example, you have six tools in our previous example. That's exactly the same example we had as before. Instead of having round robin between the tools one to six, you say no. Some of my tasks are critical, some of my tools are critical, and I'm only doing round robin among these. Right? These are the ones we get the guarantee. But among the other ones, well, the other ones, usually there is a term opportunistic scheduling in real time, which means they don't have any guarantee. But if I have a time slot where all the critical tools don't have anything, I will allow them to access them. Okay. So if you look here, instead of giving everyone uh, so if you go back to this, so give everyone a slot, C1 to C6. Let's say C1 and C2 and C3 are the critical ones, while C4, 5, 6 are not critical. My round robin schedule right now becomes C1, C2, C3, C1, C2, C3. Okay. Well, what is the advantage of this? What do you think? Critical tasks get scheduled more consistently and sooner. Yeah, exactly. And we have much less worst case latency, right? Right now, my worst case latency is. Well, if this is round robin, then I have to suffer interference from two other pools of me. So it will be n minus one multiplied by the slope width. Now it's n critical minus one. So it will be two multiplied by the slope width instead of six or instead of five. Uh, the problem is, well, the second bullet point here is that the non critical ones, there is no guarantee that they get any service at all, right? So in worst case, it has. C4, if there is a request from C4 or C5 or C6, it will not be able to access even the bus at all, right? So they might start, right? But the intuition here is that those are not critical tasks. They don't care about the recipe. You don't have those case requirements. Think about, for example, if you in your in a car or uh, in, in, uh, in a healthcare system, this is the logging system. So it's something that can work without guarantees, but as far as it maintains some good average performance or well, based on the system stressing, at some point they might have access, then, uh, well, they will be able to proceed, right? So they, both, they get no guarantees, but the premise here is that they don't even have them. Okay? They don't have requirements. 
So if I go back to the exact same example we had as before, which is at the beginning at time zero, I have C1, two, two requests from C4, and then C5 and C6, and later on C3 arrives. And let's think of how we really schedule this sequence uh, using periodically based on. So at the beginning, I'm starting with C1. Does C1 have a request? Yes, C1 is here. So I schedule C1. In the second, well, after this is round moment, so I take C1 to the back of the queue and then bring in C2 request. Does C2 have a request? Yes, then schedule it. Here at this point, I'm looking for C3. Does C3 have a, does C3 have a request? No, it didn't arrive yet, right? Based on what I told you, this is priority based on the If C3 does not have a request, this is an empty swap, slam swap, which means I am bringing in a non critical request to C3. Right. So at that moment, I look into the non-critical pools and I bring in C4. And in fact, there are two versions here. So you need to down the The version I'm showing here is that if the current schedule pool, the physical pool, does not have something, which is C3 in our case, go to the non-critical one and bring a request from there. Right? There might be another version, which is even more uh, hard for the non-critical ones, say, if this critical pool, which is C3, does not have anything, don't go directly to some critical ones. Check the other critical right? So in our example here, I come checking, uh, well, I speak with C1 and C2, I look into, well, C3 doesn't have something, then I go back and check C1 and C2. Luckily, in our example, C1 and C2 also don't have other rooms, because I already served the old two rooms. In this case, I would still really serve C2. But if it happens, and then maybe, for example, we have two requests from C1 or two requests from C2, and then adopting the second version, then in this case, I'm going to schedule either C1 or C2. Questions? In the exam, what do you assume? Basically, I either tell you the question, assume this version, from moment or briefly this round moment, or you have to write your assumption clearly, and then you have to add, right? Because both are valid in the indication sequence. Good. But do you see how does it work? So right now, C3 had to wait in worst case for only one non-critical one, right? Because it arrived just after the non-critical one has stopped, right? But there is no way after C4 finishes that, for example, C5 or 6 can start. Why? Because I have a pending request from C3. C3 is critical. Yeah, C1 to C3 are critical. Oh, but but since C3 didn't, it wasn't requested then. Yeah, 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 exactly. So here, this arrives one cycle after the beginning of the swap. Remember, we said our decision always happens at cycle by cycle basis. So at this cycle, when you take the decision, C3 wasn't there in this. So you couldn't scale it, right? In some other systems, not in bus arbiters, we say even if you start the non-critical one, you might be in, right? In the script. Remember, in here, for example, when we started the task, then after one point, another task arrives that has an early deadline. I preempt the other one, right? But preemption is not very common approach in hardware resources in general because what does it mean to preempt something in the bus? You send a request from the bus on the wires, right? You cannot really preempt, right? So there is no preemption that can happen in the bus. So once it starts, it must finish. Any other question? Okay, so now we see how priority based round robin works. So what is what is good about priority based on problem? Well, it gives us a better remote space for critical tasks, but it does not give any guarantees for the non-critical tasks. This is good and it can be used, and in fact, it might be commonly used for systems where we have only two critical tasks. All your tasks are either critical or non-critical. But in nature, zero, I give you the example of quoted that in fact we have big certification standards. There are five critical tasks, right? In avionics, there are four critical events. We call them safety assurance. In that case, what do I do for many critical tasks? Do I schedule them as critical or do I schedule them as non critical? If you schedule them as non critical, you don't have any guarantees. Well, you violate the, the requirements, the reward. If you schedule them as critical, you get the same service as the critical tasks. So now we heard the critical tasks are So it doesn't really work. Uh, it's not really just suited for multiple critical events. Good. And for that purpose, there's another approach, which is called weighted round robin. Some of these arbitrage you might have really given before, but they're also common in communication systems. I don't know. Did you guys hear about round robin before? Weighted round robin? Maybe also round robin is common in the previous system in general. 
So which is Ramon Dropper? Instead of saying that he does grant something slow or no slow, I have what I call differentiated surface. So I give every pool a different number of stops based on its requirements, right? So here in, in the example we have, you see that C1 receives two slots back to back, and C2 receives two slots. C3 only one slot, four one slot, five one slot, six one, right? So I have the ability. So now it's no longer fair, right? But I have the ability to assign different number of slots to different pools based on what. What do you think? Like if I want to assign different different slots for tools, based on what I assign the number of slots. Uh, right. Yeah, but it is one possibility, but you might end up having this is a very good point that you brought it up because later on we'll have an arbitrary that's very really accurate this point. You might end up with C1 is the highest priority. But its requirements is very is very loose. So criticality of priority does not really directly uh, associated to is not directly coupled to your own requirements, right? Yeah. You might not really be memory intensive, so you don't go to the bus as frequent, so you don't worry too much, right? So do you assign based on variability that one was strange, but it might not be the optimal. What what else? Right. Think again of the bigger picture. I assign the weights, I come up with a schedule to do what? To drive over this latency, right? Well, I drive over this latency. Why? To plug it in, in the worst case efficient time, right? Such that I make it less than that I, I compute it, and I make sure it's less than there is now, right? So if I go back from this bigger picture to the ultimate target, I would say I might assign the number of slots that gives me a worst case latency that makes the total worst case efficient time satisfies the requirement, right? So I might make it based on the requirements. Good. Uh, yeah, so address the critical requirement thing. Uh, a poor weight is decided based on, on how many service slots you receive. What I'm saying here is it has no notion of criticality because you assign it based on the requirements, which are the weights. But there is one, even if I do it based on requirements, there is one big trick here. So let's say, for example, C1 has the highest requirements, okay? Like in the highest means by time, like more right? So I may need basically to make it for the time main, right? So I give it more slots. In wicked round robin, does this really resolve into or lead to uh, a smaller risk case needs compared to round robin, for example? So let's see. But if I say I get C1 two slots, C2 two slots, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and I try to compute the worst case latency of C1, given this article, what would be the worst case needs? How many slots? Worst case you have to wait for. If you have a request from C1, what would be the worst case needs? Well, we did this last time. We look into the RB schedule and we computed those specific statements, right? What do you need to do to compute those specific statements? Determine the time span that when you arrive, that's your most fixing end, right? We call this worst fixing distance. So what would be that? Yeah. Here? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good point. Thank you. So you arrive just right after C1 and all these slots, right? The same, the same rationale as last time. Last time we had only one slot, but I arrived one second after I used the slot. But well, remember that we slightly modified this approach a little bit because we scheduled based on slots. So it's not that you arrive one slot after. You might just arrive one cycle after you lost it, right? Like at the beginning, of, because you take the decision at the beginning of the slots, right? So if I arrive here one cycle after the second shot of C1, the schedule might have already picked something else because I didn't have a request at the beginning. So I also suffer one additional slot, right? So you see that the worst case in instance, your friend said it's here, which I believe someone else also said this last time. But it's not necessarily the case. In fact, there can be a worse scenario. Because we take the decisions only at the beginning of the of the slot. So you might just arrive not here, but you arrive one cycle after, so it's here. If I do this, I lost my own order in the round robin. Slot is not a very correct word, but I use it for simplicity for round robin. Uh, 
but then for, if you arrive here, you are not being able to schedule and you wait one additional slot compared to the, your, your instance, right? Does this make sense? So in that case, what would be the worst case? The worst case is how many slots? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then I get it on the eighth, right? So I suffer interference for seven slots. If I did a fair round robin, what would be my worst case? Five, right? Because I have six scores, it's a minus one. So in fact, here, even if I have more slots, I ended up having a worse worst case, right? So in weighted round robin, if we do it that way, it does not really reflect in a smaller or tighter worst case latency, right? And that's in fact a problem, good? To address this problem, so here, this is basically what I was saying. It, it can help and achieve better performance because I can get two requests to service once I get a granted access, but it increases the worst case. Uh, to address this problem, we don't do only weighted round robin, but we do what we call harmonic weighted round robin or harmonic weighted TDM. Well, the key problem, this thing that led to this high angle case is all the slopes I granted to C1 are back to them, right? So if you lose the last one, you have to wait for while well, everyone ends. But if you distribute these two slots around your schedule, you basically distribute your service, so you give yourself a less worst case. So let me show you a picture just to make sure it uh, makes sense. So assume instead of giving these two slots to C1 back to back, I give them one here and one here. In that case, if I arrive here, one one here, one slot, one cycle after the beginning of my slot, I will only have to wait until the end, right? And if I arrive here, well, again the same thing. So if you manage to distribute your slots from the distributed round robin. And well, I get in a harmonic fashion, such a what, what do you mean by harmonic? Is basically you have to have uh, the same the same way weight between the two slots, right? Because they have to be evenly distributed in your schedule video. In that case, you suffer less worse case. In our example here, two slots for C1, and they are only separated by three slots each. In that case, what would be my worst case? Again, I arrive here, so I suffer one, two. Well, if I arrive here, this is round robin, so C2 will be scheduled here. So I suffer one, two, three slots and worse as an end of it. So then my own case. Right? Question? Make sense? So we, we took it step by step in the savings goals. We start by the easiest one here, static, and then dynamic round robin, but still fair. And then well, we said fair is good, but some good for in terms of requirement awareness. So we had the real round robin. It's good for two big cat limits only. Then we can draw on it, which can really assign different weights based on requirements, so split up in requirement awareness. Then we said it can increase the worst case latency, even if it's good for performance, then we distribute the slots. So it's basically a harmonic way to draw on. So this is good because it reduces my worst case, it's requirement aware because every pool gets its own slots based on this. But there is one problem, which is there is no notion of big time. If I'm only scheduling tasks based on the requirements, then what if two tasks have the same requirements? One of them is created, the other one is less created, right? Why notion of create time is important? Because again, go back to our practical uses. Task, for example, even if maybe the APAC, when you want to access the campus, would require one millisecond while also Wi Fi or the entertainment of the rating, it also require one millisecond. It doesn't mean that both are equal, right? I still need to have some sort of priority notion, criticality notion for the for the AOP, right? And in this case, uh, there is what we call criticality and requirement awareness situation. So if we want to summarize what we what we are doing here, these are all the arbiters we discussed so far. And we are going to look into them from a requirement awareness and criticality awareness. Again, what the requirement awareness is you assign the services. In our case, these are the slots. Based on your worst case action time requirements. Criticality awareness is, is nothing, has nothing to do with the task itself. It has to do with the physical semantics of the task. Like this is being assigned by the use case itself, by the design the system designer. It has to do with this task is critical because, well, we define the criteria and picture one, right? Does anyone remember what we mean by critical? How do we really say whether task is critical or not? No. So it's based on the notion of the consequence of the failure of the task, right? This is really what the certification authority are defining. If this task fails, 
What is the concept? For when I gave you the example of Elsa, if you lose the driver's uh, line, then well, this is a high speed system. It gets like the, the highest ASO or the, the assurance level. But if this task fails, well, air conditioning uh, might not be very convenient, right? And the weather sometimes it might be very difficult, right? But, uh, but generally it's not. And well, in fact, if it fails immediately, you still have some little time to react, right? If the GPS fails, well, might waste half an hour when you're in this no big problem. If the Wi Fi fails, it's even less important, right? So think of the failure consequences. And based on this, you define with our process great solution. Good. Okay, so for my great awareness, round robin is not requirement aware. Why round robin is not requirement aware? Let's make sure you all understand. Yeah, because it's big. It gives equal numbers of one small per group. The same thing for TDM. I don't have TDM here. Because round robin TDM are the same thing in, in terms of requirement awareness and criticality awareness. It's not criticality awareness because again, it does not have any kind of criticality. Everyone gets the same service. Priority based round robin. Well, when I have this exclamation mark here, it means, well, it has some support. It's not complete support, right? It's not an X and it's not like a green check mark, right? So why it has some notion of requirement awareness? Because it really wise and really done hard over the number which also means a notion of criticality. One problem is that it combines both into the same notion. But it's limited because it only works for two criticality levels. Weighted round topic is not criticality I would like to But also it has a limited support of requirement elements. We said that this happens because you can assign different number of slots. But this does not necessarily lead to a high amount of vacancy. Harmonic, harmonic round robin is required in a way, right? That's that's the first one we have really as a green chip. Why? Because I reduce the worst case latency, I can assign slots distributed in a fashion that meets the requirements of different types. But it has no notion of criticality, right? And then what we're looking for is a criticality and requirement of an arbiter that is both requirement aware and criticality aware. Uh, well, I might just leave this part for you reading. But going back, going back to the traditional model we were discussing, this is what we already had before. So we said a task, instead of defining it with its criticality levels, deadline, and worst case, I think the worst case is extreme time. And right now, well, decompose it into its components. Worst case computation time, worst case number of requirements for the shared resource. And the worst case interference you suffer from the resource, right? Worst case computation time, I compute using the traditional method we discussed earlier, static planning analysis, boring, merit, or measurement based. Worst case interference, this comes from the resource itself. All what we do in this lecture and the, the second half of the previous lecture is to try to study the arbiter, compute the worst case latency, and then multiply this by the number of frequencies in the new argument. Good. Then in this case, the worst case extension time of the task would be the worst case computation time plus worst case number of frequencies multiplied by the worst case interference in each request when you or the worst case latency. Good. Uh, here I'm showing you one example of uh, an existing criticality and requirement aware arbiter. It's, it builds on top of, it might be seen very common, but I, I wouldn't be well aware. So it builds on top of a harmonic round robin, weighted harmonic round robin, the one that we discussed the last. But instead of saying we only have harmonics and weights based on the requirement, I also decouple the notion of criticality. So we say we have two tier schedules. We have a head based schedule. The first schedule is what we call a class weighted round robin. So we define our tasks. I told you that in certification, there are criticality levels, right? Assurance. We call them classes. So you take the tasks of the same criticality class, and then you combine them into what you call a class. So you end up with different classes. All the tasks within a class have the same requirements, sorry, the same criticality, but different classes are different criticalities, right? And then you schedule, you have a weighted round robin schedule between classes. So that's the first tier. In the second tier, within a class, it's, within a class, we said tasks have the same criticality, but you don't necessarily need the same requirement, right? So in the second level, you address the requirement problem. So you go within a class and you say, 
I look into the tasks for that class. I look into the requirements and schedule them using with the ground, harmonic with the ground. So you start by scheduling this character and then go to the same independent level and then schedule this with the requirements. So you don't need to go into details into this, but uh, again, I will leave this for your reading. I, I wouldn't assume you know all the example detail because it's a little bit complex, but if someone is interested of how does this one address all the problems we discussed so far, uh, we quickly discussed it and you can look into uh, into these main points. So as I was saying, you combine tasks with same criticality into classes and you use a hierarchical arbitration to split basically the interclass interference from the interclass which means, well, right now you schedule based on criticality. And then within a class, you do a harmonic weighted round robin, which is basically a requirement. Good. Is there any question? Yep. Yeah, harmonic weighted round robin. So in field one, you field the class based on harmonic round robin. But this is between classes. But then within the classes, like for example, let's see if I have three. So in this example, I have three classes. I have a red one, which is highest critical. The yellow one, which is well, medium critical, and the green one is non critical. So I schedule them based on weighted ground by harmonic weighted ground So you see that there's a red, 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 right? Yellow, yellow, and then green, green. And then I go with it. This is basically a class, which means in fact, inside there are all the classes. So I take this one and I go into the second level and I look into the tasks within the high screen, for example, because this is the red one. I have two tasks, for example, uh, tell one one and tell one two. Some of them might have different requirements. Here they have the same requirements, so I give them one spot. But if you look here, you find that different tasks have different requirements, right? That is, you go to schedule them based on how many really count, right? So you do two schedules. One based on class, which is the entirety of it, and then we have class here, and we need to drop it for tasks so that let's answer question. Yeah. Okay, good. So I would say let's let's take four minutes break. I upload the the new slides and we'll start at ten fifteen. Oh, ten fifteen, eleven fifteen. Thank 
How is that project demo going? How many people do we need to finish the demo? There's only one last one. Okay. Do you face any problem? Is there anything that you want to share? <laughs> How do you find it? Do you find it challenging, interesting, in the right level, pretty easy? I thought it was great. I thought it would be uh, yeah. properly the previous thing that I found that really well. So in the project, basically everything you have done so far is basically in the project, right? It's How? Integrated. Yeah, integrated. How many of you did do that once? Did you do it? Yeah, well, at least try it. You you made it. Okay, can you raise your hand? Oh wow, that's that's uh, okay. That's good. Last time we didn't have that number. Okay, so if there is any feedback again you want to share, let us know. It might be that hungry, so sometimes critical issues arrive. Yeah, one feedback would be the more experience and system. Yeah, that's it. It's still happening for that human project one. I mean, last time we did a virtual machine. In fact, in, in project two, we'll go back to the virtual machine because stage four and all over supporting me as well. This some green issue, green really issue, this is basic for it at the end of it, right? Uh, but last time, the reason we sent from a virtual machine to the native IED, and in fact, to add this to this one, but it didn't add it. So we, we keep trying. Okay, so now, yeah, Hadith. Let's reopen. Let's again. We did the Windows for project. Ah, well, I, at the very least, well, if it comes to me, I'm, I'm fine. I, but, but I know that I'm not a very straight safety issue. I mean, like, I, I don't care as much, right? The problem is that from an IT department perspective, they feel that it's really the way it might lead to safety problems. And then, but at least what I'm discussing was through the, the main TA for the lab yesterday. So at least in the demo time, we will give you the weeks. Like, one reason we don't give everyone the week is that basically you might. I will bomb the prescription. Go out of control. The problem with that is that we have to run that 60 kilometers per hour. So it's very, very fast. So if you lose control for some reason, or you, your code is not very, very fine in terms of simplification of doing it, right? It doesn't, it, it might lead to consequences, right? Then, which means it's a great uh, But what we can do is if we have a set of weeks only for the group that is dead, I guess that's it. And we want you to have the feeling of yes, when you have it running. So in project two, in fact, what you will be doing is uh, you will have the ultrasonic and you have the camera, and then you want to avoid uh, you want to go left or right, and then avoid any obstacles. So this really does not guarantee you able to not have it in the ground. Uh, so my plan is at least the group that is demoing, you give them the weeds, and then they do the demo. Uh, I know this might not satisfy what you guys are looking for. But Let's see. So one thing I have in mind is the plan. You will imagine that here, if in fact something we can do is you can uh, we can organize the competition. Right? This is really how we should like we should book a gym, we should have a racing uh, or a, a meeting. And then well, if someone is interested, you take it and it's third. What we need in project two is also still meeting, right? Traffic uh, like I would obviously avoid an ultrasonic only and very minimal uh, Image recognition using camera, that's still not the full potential that you can do with that set of drive. So, if someone is interested to continue, then our plan, hopefully, you coming here is we uh, make a competition, 
basically it's optional to up to you. And then the groups that are willing to continue, uh, we plan this competition to bring in some industry, uh, stone sort of NXP. I already had discussion with them. Uh, and then we do a race who can win first, or like who can really go through the maze with the minimum time. Like those five autonomous car challenges. Uh, that's something might be also taking a little bit further than as well done in the world. But we are limited by the time and the resources and the setup of the lab. That's the problem we're facing. So if there are other ideas or feedback on the lab, just let me know. I guess I'm more interested to, to hear from you. So that's the second time you go for it, and we are hoping that we make it better and better every time. So let me know if you have any feedback. I really glad you Good. Okay, so going back to the technical stuff. So if I go back to the bigger picture, we discussed so far this uh, well, this this blue arrow, which is the interpreting of the bus. There are other shared resources in modern systems on each other, including shared caches and shared memory, which we're going to focus on. Well, this lecture is the shared cache. But I'm hoping in the next lecture we start the shared DNA. This is basically the motivation we discussed earlier. But let's let's go back to the caching system. The good thing is that last time I gave you a very high level uh, view of caches. So some of you mentioned that we even gave here this once before. We didn't take 40 yet. So I said, let's really discuss it a little bit more. Just make sure you understand it. In modern CPUs, there is a great tension between how much storage you have and the access time of that storage. Right? That's really the whole story of having caches and not the limits of cache. So, well, the largest storage you have in your laptop, for example, is your hardness, right? Whether it's SSD or HD, it, it, it doesn't really matter, right? Like it's it's busy with a magnetic, magnetic disk or non volatile memory. At the end, this is something in terabytes on laptops, but it's very, very thin, right? Thousands of cycles, right? Uh, so that's really the furthest from the processor and the slowest one, but the highest capacity. On the other hand, well, the one that is close to the processor, not even the cache, the range, right? Every ADU or every arithmetic logic unit inside the processor itself, you have a set of registers that store immediate values, right? Those registers are the fastest because, in fact, they are just one side of access. Why it decouples with the processor logic? But it's, well, every register is what, 64 bit in modern laptops, right? It's very, very small right? in terms of bits. So we need something in between. To well, address this tension between capacity and access. And this is the idea of having multiple levels of caches and memories. Uh, so, well, there is M2 is storage 2, M3 is storage 3, but if I go to a higher level picture, uh, yeah, this is what we're saying is that upper components, which are the ones that are basically closer to the processor, they are fast, they are small, because you want them to be very small in terms of. Yeah, why would it be small? Because, for example, caches are uh, composed of what we call an SRAM, type of memory called SRAM. Every single cell is six transistors, which is very expensive. You might ask yourself this question why your laptop might have a 64 gig of DRAM, but only a few million of cache? Why well, cache is very fast? Because the cost is the cost is an order of magnitude. DRAMs are very cheap because every single cell is only one transistor capacity. Why is it cache six transistors? Right. Uh, so it's, it has to be small because of the cost and because it's expensive. Yeah. So lower components, the ones that are part of the processor, they are very slow. They are big in terms of capacity because they are cheap. And then they are connected usually using interconnect. This is what we have already discussed. Our goal is that even if we have this hierarchy, we want to minimize the times that we go to the lowest right to the dead or to the main memory. So we want all the time to access the memory that is close to the processor. Uh, and then we want some mechanism to automatically move the data between these levels in the background. So that the processor itself is not aware that this happens, right? For example, if, uh, if you try to access a data that does not exist in the M1 because it's very small, but it exists in M3, in the background, M1 will ask M2, which will ask M3 to bring in this data, We'll come to M1. Once we come to M1, the CPU will be okay. Our overall target in, in modern uh, computer architecture is to optimize the average access. 
And in fact, that's one of the biggest problems we have in real time is with spastic. Because you try to optimize with the average access time, most of the time you penalize the worst case scenario. Because there is a trade off for people, as we will see. So, uh, well, memory error is based on a storage time. You said that there are registers, few locations, 32 or 64, based on what machine you have. They're accessed directly using the instruction set itself, like uh, if you wrote assembly sometime in your life, you can write add R1, R2, R3, for example. This R1, R2, R3 are the regional themselves. You can access them from the instruction. And then they are qualified. What do you mean by qualified? What is that with you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. You use once you lose your power from, from, from this resource, you, you basically does not does not really store it, right? So you lose the data you have inside this storage. So registers are qualified, which means if you close your laptop and reopen it, the data is in there. And then we have memory, including caches, uh, which are disk RAMs, and uh, main memory, which is DRAM, can have many locations. They access through the um, indirect if they use a library instruction set using load storage instructions, and they are still qualified, but most of them are qualified. There are some new approaches for having non qualified memory in the end, et cetera, et cetera, but obtain from Intel, but the most common ones we have in our laptop so far are qualified ones. And then there is a desk, which is virtually an entry kind of application, because with the virtual memory, I hope you discuss this in the operating system course, they are not answered by the user level instructions, they are actually by the operating system. And they are not qualified. Whenever you have a new test, it remains in your test, you close your laptop and reopen it, it's still there. If we look into, well, here we had them as an abstract memory resource, right? But if we look into what is in a modern processor, we know now that the furthest is the desk. There is the main memory, which is the DRAM. There are multiple cache levels here. There is, for example, an L2, and then L1 is divided into instruction cache and data cache. And then there is the processor that has the registers with the age to find. Good. If you want to have a feeling of some numbers for modern processors, the well, zero level is the registers that we discussed them. The primary cache, which is plain instruction and data cache, they are typically in the range of 8 kilobytes to 64 kilobytes right? in terms of kilobytes. The second level, well, in modern days, here I'm saying like typically 0.5 mega into 16 mega. 16 mega even is the big number might be interesting in servers for the second level of cache. And then the third level of cache, uh, well, uh, well, here is the third level of cache. I'm talking lines about the main memory, but in some modern laptops, especially nowadays, we have also an S3, which usually goes to 64 megs, might be. And then we have the DRAM, which is an office chair main memory. This is the DAM, that basically, if you have ever seen a DAM in a desktop, right? That's, that's it's a commodity thing you can buy from Amazon, as I said before. It's made of dynamic memory. It's typically in the range of well, this is a very old slide. So it's in the range of 16 gigabytes. Right now, you can buy laptops with 64 gigabytes, or even more. Servers can have hundreds of gigabytes, basically, because memory is very typical for servers. And then the fourth level is the disk. Now, this is the range of uh, well, magnetic is one case, whereas SSD is another case, and uh, they go into the range of terabytes. Good. If I look into a modern chair, this is the i7 uh, flow plan, like the, the i7 flow plan. You will find that well, this takes a change from the processor. I'm trying to, to identify from here what we see from the chair design itself is dedicated to memories. I don't even have a desk because this is something different. And I don't have the main memory, I don't even want to cache the registers. You will find that this big chunk is for the L1. This big chunk is for the L1. There is here instruction fetch and L1 cache. This is about instruction L1 cache. This is L1 data cache. And there's also some logic for paging. So you can see that there is a huge real estate that is dedicated to memory in modern uh, chips, right? Sometimes people say this reached up to 70% of your chips, in fact, dedicated to memory. This wasn't the case before. Maybe in fact, 90% of your chip, when I say before, it was like, late 80s, early 90s, most of the innovation and uh, focus was going to the logic on the memory. But people realized that memory is a big problem in modern, you have to, to deal with a huge amount of data, as we said before. 
And who doesn't get this, you need to indicate a lot of the real estate in the chat, the real estate in the, in the chat for, uh, for memories and caches. As I was saying, much of the chip area today is used for caches. Here I have, well, this is a, a, a very old Intel 486. This is one of the earliest Intel processors. You can see that one, this is only the type that goes to the memory. Uh, and then here I'm talking about IBM Power 5, which is still a, really a, a modern processor. You can see the difference in the area between this one and this one. All these areas, in fact, going to caches, right? You can see. As I was saying, today it's like 30 to 70 percent are only looking at the chip design. If I look at the 4i7, wow, uh, this is the shared L3. This is inside that core, there is, all, there is also the L1 and L2. But as you can see, this is on its own, is in fact taking around a quarter of maybe a little bit less. But this is L3 in addition to the L1 and L2 inside each core here. Good. So one big question. All of this has nothing to do with the analysis so far. I'm talking about from a viewer understanding of modern chips or modern computer design. Why really we have all these things of cash? Why why it makes sense? Why is it useful and you are investing? So the idea is there's something called that 1090 rule, right? So when people look into analyzing existing modern applications, they thought that nine ten percent of static instructions account for 90% of the execution time. What does this mean? If you look into your instructions of your program, 10% of the instructions only contribute to the 90% of the execution of that program. Which means if I then cache those 10% of the instructions into the N1, for example, the one instruction cache, I can accelerate heavily my execution time, right? And then also, this is basically a new problem, right? When the numbers can vary from application to application, it's just an average observation. 10% of the variable to the data also accounts for 90% of the app, which means if I then cache the minimum amount of data based on my program, the one that are default talk in, in, in program profiling, I then gain access them very fast, and hence my short time will also be very fast, right? So the idea is even if you have huge data and even if you have a huge number of instructions, only minimal ones, small ones, small percentage of them, you are able to cache into your higher limits of the one that's closer to the CPU, you can accelerate a lot of your execution. And those that have taken 40 m there is this uh, rule that's called Anders law, right? When you make that, basically how, how fast you make part of a program based on what is the percentage of instruction they have in the room. So there are a lot of mathematical problems in order to see that I went through them. Uh, the equation is not that simple as if I focus on this 10 percent, I can really accelerate a lot of my execution. Good. Is there any question so far? Okay. So why also does this work? For another reason, which is locality. In modern applications, I told you, well, if I go back to this figure here, I told you if, if something does not exist in the L1, L1 is a small capacity, you have to go and break it from the L2. If it does not exist in the L2, you break it from the main memory. But if I break it from the main memory to the L2, to the L1 and leave it here, the premise is if you access it once, most likely you are going to access it again. Right? This is called the locality concept in computer programs. Right? If you access one value, you're going to access it again. And it's called temporal locality. Can you think of an example in a software, in a C code or a Python code where I keep accessing the data again and again and again? You have a loop, right? You want to speak from the end of the if you have a loop, for example, in that case, you go through the same number of instructions, exactly the same instruction repeated multiple times. So this instruction itself is going to be cached in the L1 instruction gap when you have it in. And then also the data you access, right? You keep accessing it again and again. Once you bring it once to the cache, it will be hidden in the cache, and then the access time will be very fixed. This is called uh, the moral locality. And then there is another concept. That is called spatial locality. I will take exactly the same example I gave you about loops, but instead of accessing the same data, I'm telling you that through that loop, I'm accessing an array, right? So I keep enlisting an array. Arrays is stored, like, as you know, from 2SH to SI, arrays are stored back to back continuously in the memory, which means if you access 
like index zero direct, and then has index one, and then two, and then three. Most likely, we trust five, and then six, and seven. So, if that's the case, then the cache hierarchy. Once you find you access one cache line, one entry in an array, for example, index zero. The cache system should go and bring in not only n zero, but also n one and two and three. It's called spatial dependence. So you don't only bring the block you want to access now, but you also bring the blocks that are adjacent. Why? Because from a locality concept, spatial dependence comes most likely when you access them. Well, things are raised for you. Good. So due to temporal locality and spatial locality, caches work very well. Right? Because once you cache those data, you're going next time you access them, they will be hit, and you save hundreds of cycles of accessing the main thing. Good. So, a cache is a hardware management. So, the hardware, as I said, like the progress doesn't need to get when you write a Python code or a CPU, you don't have to worry too much how does the cache work. In fact, you guys already took two, three programming courses, and some of you might not know what is a cache, right? Why that's the case? Because hardware is completely oblivious to software. Hardware is managing all this background notion without needing to care about it, as in that programming system. Uh, and usually this is only chip, this is already known, and then the DRAM is only chip. The cache organization, well, this is, I will not go into detail of all these cache behaviors because it requires new data and a bigger picture flows. But these EBCs are basically the design of the cache. How do we design the cache? How many blocks do we bring? What is the size of the cache? If something is full, uh, I guess I told you this last lecture, you need to invent something to bring in a new line, right? All of these design uh, parameters, design space, you need to take account for. Uh, the ultimate target is to reduce the number of misses. You want to hit into your cache as much as you can, and you want to minimize your miss right? So if you miss the cache and you go to the second level, you want this latency to be minimal. And you also want to minimize your hit latency. If I hit in the cache, I want this to happen as soon as this. Um, I will just leave this for you to, to revise if someone someone who does not really uh, does not really know caches very much. I took these slides from the major picture course I took. But maybe the something that is very important for all of us to understand is this equation. Right? Uh, this equation needs a little bit of modification. So let's so just assuming an uh, the head to be always. Uh, well, let's just write it like that. So you have to understand this this equation. So the intuition is the form. I want to calculate. So if I go back to my scenario. I go to the end one. As a possibility, I might miss, I might hit or miss, right? If I hit, it's very fast. Assume, for example, it's one cycle. If I miss, I might go to the second level, which might take 10 cycles. Right now, your average access time through the memory will depend on what level, what level of a cache you're hitting, right? So in that case, well, there is no one access latency of the cache, right? So if you go back to the arbitrary of the starting we had so far, we said worst case latency is when number of slopes multiplied by the slope width, right? What is the slope width? It's the time required to access the bus and go to the shared memory, for example. The problem is that your access time to the shared memory will vary based on what level you are in, and based on whether you hit or miss, right? So it's not a fixed time. It's why we calculate the average access. If I know that my rate is going to be divided between the number of hits and number of misses to that cache. So if you look into one cache level, if I have one axis, this axis can be either a hit or a miss. If it's a hit, I'm going to bring in this line from this bench. If it's a miss, I have to go to the second element, right? And hit is much faster than miss, right? By constructing. In that case, if I want to calculate my average line, I look into all number of frequencies I have. I divide them into hits and misses. I take the hit percentage. What's the hit percentage? Basically, hit over the different number of frequencies. Are multiplied by the end access time. And then I take the miss percentage and multiply it by the miss access. And this will give me the, the average access time. Do I have a numerical number here? 
If I don't have a numeric anomaly, let's walk through an, an example with numbers. Assume I'm talking about L1. Add a slide. So assume I'm telling you that this is an L1 cache with a T head equal to one cycle and T miss is equal to 10 cycles, which is the access latency of the L2. And then I'm telling you that your program has, for example, let's say 100 loads and store instructions, so 100 memory requests. I call this R. And then based on my profiling of the cache, Let's say 80 of them are hits into the L1 and 20 of them are miss. If I want to calculate the total time of these 100 requests, I would say, well, 80 of them would suffer a latency of one cycle. And then this is basically T total. And 20 of them will suffer the miss access latency of 10 cycles. Correct? So in that case, I will have a total delay of 280 cycles. Right? If I want to calculate the average latency suffered by a single request, so this is basically bare request, what do I do? Well, average is just simple. Take the total, divide by the number, right? So you have 280 divided by 100, which means on average, your request suffers 2.8 cycles, correct? This is exactly the equation we had earlier. How that's the case, we said that T average is equal to my head percentage, which is 80 divided by 100, multiplied by miss access, my head access time, which is one, and this is 20 divided by 100, multiplied by your miss latency, which is 10. If you calculate this one, it's going to give you 0.8 plus two, which is 2.8, right? So what is the semantic of the T average? It's on average, if I have a request that is going to the L1, it's going to suffer 2.8 cycles. Is there any question here? Uh, yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. So here we're assuming that every in this in, in this simple problem, we're assuming that anything that misses in the L1 is going to hit in the L2, which is incorrect. Later on, usually the, this T average is in fact a hierarchical value of. So what we do is let me see if I have slides for that. Yeah, no, but I should uh So your 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 friend here is, is is asking a very good question. Is that my assumption is that out of these hundred requests, we said eighty are hits in the L1, twenty are oh that's hit. This is L1 miss. But in fact, L1 misses. Assume, for example, I have an architecture of an L1, L2, and then a main memory DRAM, for example. And the my program has eighty requests. So uh, sorry, 100 requests. So those 100 go to the L1. Out of them, 80 are serviced already from the L1, but 20 will go down the street. It doesn't mean that those 20 will all hit in the L2, right? This was just a simplification I have done for the problem. Out of these 20, let's say 15 hit in the L1, in the L2, and five go to the DRAM. And let's say we said already the L1 access time, so we need some numbers here. L1 access, which is L1 head, is one cycle. Let's say L2 head is 10 cycles. And DRAM access is 100 cycles. OK, so these are my numbers for these cache hierarchies. If I want to calculate the total latency of my 100 requests, what do I do? I say, let's take them one by one. I have 80 that I'm going to bring from the L1. Right? So it just takes one cycle. And then I have 20, that out of them 15 will be hit in the L2. So it will be 15 multiplied by 10. And then I have five that go to the DRAM. 
and suffer 100 cycles, right? So this is the total delay. So this is T total of the 100 requests. So in 500 to 150, so 650 and then 80, 730, right? Maybe I'm mistaken, but let's say this is just the number. This is the total latency suffered by all the 100 requests. If I want the average, I say 730 divided by 100. So I suffer an average latency of 7.3 cycles. Good. This is basically how it's being done logically. If we want to extend our equation that we had earlier, to account for this, so what we will usually do uh, is is to say the following. So your T average, if you have multiple levels, first of all, our equation for a single level was that T average is percentage of hit in that level multiplied by percentage of miss. Well, multiplied by the, we call it T hit, the hit latency of that level, and then the percentage of misses in this level multiplied by the TMS of that level. But if I want to generalize, that's not a single number. So what people usually do is extend this by saying it's hit multiplied by T hat plus you have a miss percentage. And then you open another equation, say this T miss average is in fact the percentage of hit in the second level. So I will call this one, 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 one. This is one, 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 which is level one, and this is two. Multiply by your head latency, T2 head plus percentage of mess in two, multiply by T mess of two, right? Because if you think about it, if I am missing in the L1, I'm going to suffer exactly the same scenario again. I'm going to the L2, some of them will be heads, some of them will be misses, and then I need to calculate the average, right? So, and you can basically, if you have any levels, you can really expand this three further, right? You can say this percentage that misses in the, the level two, it can also be, uh, it can also be just this. This one, if I have a level three cache, then it's not a single number. I need to take the average, so I expand this by another level of equation. Questions? Especially those that didn't really see this before in an architecture course. Does this make any sense to you? Do you have questions? We're trying to abstract the concepts as much as we can. It's just a matter of thinking, OK, what latency do I suffer, right? And if you have some numbers, you can really walk through an example. OK, good. So if I go back for what we care about, what we discussed so far is something that is not really directly related to real-time embedded systems, but it's just the general computer architecture concepts. If I, if I want to use CASIS for real-time, my well, first one goal is predictability, right? I want to make sure I'm predictable. What do I mean by predictability? I can drive a loose case efficient time, then to assess it whether it exceeds the deadline or not. So I need balance. I need latency, worst case latency, right? The problem is that caches are very bad for data. Why that's the case? Because there's a huge variability in the access. If I go back to those equations, well, do I suffer T head in day one? Do I suffer T miss in day two? Do I suffer which level do I mess? So think about someone doing static time analysis and you give them three levels of caches and it needs to assess for every single request with a way to head which level of Right? A level of complexity that is huge, right? So caches with their variability after time, they make it very complex for static time analysis. Why? Because heads usually are very fast and misses are very slow. And whether a cache line is missed or hit depends really on the running state of the application. Why that's the case? Because when a cache line will be hit, I have accessed before, or I have accessed something close to it before. Such as the cache has got like the locality concept we just discussed, right? When the cache might be a mess, maybe I didn't access it before, or I access it but it have been has been evicted because the cache was full, right? So there is a lot of machinery that is required to, to know whether a cache access is a mess or a hit, right? 
And then if there is a source of interference, well, we'll see if we have multiple, the probability will become source. So there are multiple sources of interference for caches. The first one is what we call the intra task interference. That if I'm analyzing a single task in a single tool, which is spending time in another for example, there is still an interference between the two systems. And there is what we call an intra pool interference. If I have a unit processor system with multiple passes that are running in that system, right? This is the simple model we started with. There is also a cache interference problem. There is the inter pool if you have a multi pool architecture. In an intra task interference, a task affects its own cache right? So if a cache is full, you access cache money. It's a mess. You have to break it from the main memory, put it in the cache, but if it's something else, right? This will change the behavior of another cache money from a being a hit to a mess. So a task will evict its own cache lines. Two memory working sets are not the same cache set, happens in a single two systems. An inter pool interference happens within a pool. Like if a task is preempting another, like remember, you know, when we had scheduling, we had multiple tasks, for example, scheduled using EDF. And we said, well, right now we move from this task to this task. Think about a real system where you have two tasks, only two tasks. One task is running in a processor. It's bringing all its cache data into the cache, access, and then it's done. And then another task starts. What's going to happen? It's going to pollute the cache pattern, the biggest ones, right? Because if you are using the same cache in the same process, right? So moving between tasks, this is usually called as a context switch, either for computer architecture or operating systems, right? Once you do context switch between threads, for example, in a pool or between tasks, you will use the cache with the previous task, right? So a preempting task evicts the preempted task cache data. And then an inter pool interference, this happens in a multi pool. If tasks are running, each one in a the pool, they share a cache. This is the example we gave before. They can evict each other. Again. Good. So we have three main problems. Well, how to solve this one? We need to solve it for modern multi pool architecture, the new systems. The first one is, well, let's not use, use cache in the middle. I have an ideal solution. Well, I have a bug, because right now, if I only have a main memory, it has 100 cycles of access time, if it's in your request, we'll suck 100 cycles of access time. We intend to create the very, well, very, very good, right? The problem is, it significantly hurts performance. If you look into all the investors, for example, the ones you might have used in three hours or hours what was the second year project? Yes. So, yes, yeah. So you use, for example, a CI board or a keyboard, and basically whatever board you can use, those all the embedded systems, you really don't have that, right? You only have like, small disk racks, right? Very static, there is no multiple cache hierarchy. This complexity does not exist for traditional embedded systems. Why? Because, well, just I don't need this high performance. And it's very predictable if I don't have caches because I can't bound the cycle by cycle limit my access. What is the problem? It's no longer accepted for modern things. In automotive and avionics, running machine learning algorithms, in being drawn or get it doesn't work. I cannot really afford to try to take an Arduino or, or a CI, simple CI board that has an ARM Cortex M0 and try to run machine learning on it for a car. doesn't really work. As you can see in project two, to be able to run this, um, this, this camera and the ultrasonic by using the Raspberry Pi. We went away from the Cortex M4, which is the NXP uh, FM64, into using the Raspberry Pi, which has multiple, multiple limits of cache, because that's the only way we can run these kind of algorithms, right? So it's, it, it's not really simple to say I cannot use cache with modern algorithms. That's not a solution. But let's say if I apply the solution, what's going to happen if we have a, if we take numbers, I have thousand instructions, and put them on memory accesses, and I have 10 misses. Well, if my, if my cache head time is one cycle, my cache miss time is another cycle. Assuming everything is a mess, you cannot really leverage any head analysis here, right? So in that case, you say, well, maybe I should write this example with you. So my program is composed of 900 instructions that are not memory operations. Let's say addition multiplication. Each one of them takes one cycle. And then I have 100 memory accesses that I can classify them into 10 misses only and nine hits. If I don't have caches, what is going to happen? Well, there is no concept of hits at all, right? So everything is going to be a memory access time. 
So my access now will be well 900 for the non-memory instructions and then 100 accesses multiplied by 100 cycles. This is basically gives well this number, right? What would be my actual? So this is basically my worst case execution time, right? So this is my worst case execution time. Why? Because I took all my computation instructions and multiplied by their access latency. I took my memory operations, multiply them by the memory access latency. But if you remember, we had this graph before and we said worst case execution time is here. Best case execution time is here. And you have some sort of an average here for the actual execution time. If I want to, act to calculate the actual, assuming that you have caches in your system, what is going to be that? What we have done before, well, 900 remains 900 because these are non-memory memory instructions. 90 memory accesses will suffer only one cycle because these are heads. 10 of them only will suffer the 100. So I ended up with around 2,000 cycles of an actual execution time. So compare your actual execution time of 2,000 cycles to around 11,000 cycles of worst case execution time. That's more than 5x gap between your estimate and the actual execution time, which means your bounds are very, very loose. Like if you look into this graph, you didn't put your worst case execution time here, but you put it some way far. So you are very, very conservative in that sense, right? So your bounds are not very useful, in fact. Good. Well, if I want tighter bounds, why I, I care about tighter bounds? Because it gives you more performance in your system, right? If 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 your actual execution time is 2,000 cycles, but you say I'm going to suffer 11,000 cycles, this prevents you from really optimizing your system. So one way to say, okay, if I have caches, instead of assuming everything is a mess, what can I do is I start doing a hit-miss analysis, right? So I, I go into my static analysis tools and ask them, also classify my memory accesses into hits and misses. Well, the question is, how do I know whether a cache is a miss or a hit? Well, you assume that you have your running path, so you analyze everything. That's the static timing analysis. Assume that the task is not interrupted at all, and assume that you know what is the cache replacement policy and how does it impact you. Good. So you know all the details. So remember, we said static timing analysis is a box that would require two things, your task, and your architecture model. This assumption here about knowing replacement policy is an architecture model. Assuming that you know the running path, that's a task information. And assume that the task is not interrupted, that's a task information. Good. If I'm able to bound, knowing that out of the 100 accesses I have, 10 of them are hits and, and 90 are misses, I end up with a very tighter bound. The problem is, I need a lot of information. As I told you before, that's very complex to be able to come with, right? Uh, and the problem is if I have also multi-core, that's almost impossible. Why? Because if you do all of this in a single task in isolation system, once tasks run together in a multi-core architecture, well, they interfere with each other, they evict each other line. There is no way really I can have a hit miss analysis for a task. Why? The exact same example we had before, two tasks running in two different cores, one can evict the cache line of another one. So I cannot really analyze my task in isolation. Well, similar to what we have done for the interconnect, which is if I cannot really bound stuff, I need to come up with architectures that are predictable by nature. So we discussed predictable interconnect arbiters, round robin, TDM, which will, they are predictable because they give you a way to provide a bound. I don't take caches from normal systems as is, but on the other hand, I try to modify their architecture to provide bounds as well. And there are different techniques that are done by different industries like Intel, ARM, and others. They do really some of that part, um, some of these techniques, or in fact, multiple of them combined together. So it's what we call cache partitioning. There is cache locking and there is software managed caches. And we're going to discuss each one of them hopefully, and then we conclude the lecture. So what is cache partitioning? So we said the problem is, so before you go into the details, if my problem is that I have two tasks running on two cores, that's core zero, that's core one. This is running task zero, this is running task one. And this is a shared cache. If the two tasks 
go to the shared cache, and then task one is able to evict cache lines from task zero, I cannot analyze task zero in isolation. I cannot come up with a cache miss hit analysis, and then I'm done. One way to say, well, this is why this problem is happening, because the cache is shared between both. What you can do is you say, I'm going to partition my cache into different partitions. So I would say for task one, I'm going to take that partition. Let's use different colors. So if this is task one, I'm going to take half of the cache for me. Task zero cannot access it, right? On the other hand, task zero will take the other half. How does this solve the problem? Well, it's no longer a shared resource, right? So any request that is coming from task zero will not be able to go to the task one partition, and hence it will not be able to evict task one accesses, right? So you basically partition the resource such that there is no competition on accessing that resource. Does this make sense? So cache partitioning is in fact very common in, in, in modern embedded systems. Uh, well, there are multiple partitioning techniques based on some understanding of how the cache is really structured in a set associative cache. I, don't know, I didn't mention what is a set associative cache. Um, I need to go into that detail. If some of you doesn't know what is a cache architecture, we think. Not necessarily the case. So let, let's not really do that. But instead, I want to show you what happens in, in, modern, uh, in modern platforms. Can I? Let me see. Let's let's discuss this a little bit. So and I, I will I will throw on you another concept related to caches. So if you hear it for the first time, let's take a second, explain it, ask me questions if you don't get it. So my cache, which I think is a very big memory, is in fact not designed or architected that way. Usually people define it into what we call sets. Good. And then within a set, there are multiple cache lines. So we call this, let's say this is set zero, this is set one, set two, et cetera, et cetera. Why do I do this? Because I want, this again has something to do with the computer architecture of the cache, but the idea is I want when I have a request address to first go to a certain set and then look into the lines of that set, which we call ways to see whether I have my line or not. And instead of searching the whole cache, I only search that set, so it saves my searching time. So if you hit into the cache, it means your line is there. But the question is where in the cache it is, because if your cache is big, like one megabyte, for example, not every time you're going to access that cache, you're going to search the full one megabyte. This will make your hit latency very large, right? So what you do in a seed is, based on the address, you go to a certain place in the cache and look whether your line is there or not, right? In a general cache architecture or in our modern platform, it's called a set associative cache. Why set associative? Because the cache is divided into multiple sets, and within a set, there are multiple cache lines or ways. Good? Is that clear? Is that concept clear? So if I take a request address, assume that my cache line is 64 bytes, so I have some offset at the beginning here that I don't worry about, and then I have what I call the set number or the index, set index. And then I have the rest of the line, which I call attack. I take that address as a processor, well, as my cache controller, and then ignore the cache line offset bits because this tells me what byte inside the cache line. I need first to find the cache line. I take the set index and go to that set. So now instead of searching the whole cache, I go to a certain set, set zero, for example. And then the rest of the address I'm going to use to compare the tag. So here I also stole store all the tags of all the lines I have in a set, and then compare the tag with the tag. Is it there? Is it the same line I'm looking for? If it is, then that means it's a hit. If I search it the whole set and I didn't find my line, it's a mess, right? And then I go to bring it from another level. Is that clear? What we're going to discuss right now will depend on, you know, on this terminology. So if you have questions, ask. So the summary is caches are divided into sets, Within a set, we have few lines that we call ways. Good. Question? 
OK, so based on this discussion, there are two methodologies of doing the partitioning. So if I go back here, I told you I'm going to partition this cache into two parts. But you know now that this cache is not really one big chunk. It sits, right? So there are two ways of discussing of 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 uh, of um, of partitioning the cache. I either take the sets, assume, for example, I have two sets only. I either do what I call set partitioning, which means set zero will go to task zero and set one will go to task one. So this is called set partitioning. Or I do the other way of partitioning, which is within a set, I take a number of ways. Let's say every set has two, uh, four ways. So I say way zero and way one. So this is way zero, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three. So I say in set zero, I take way zero and one to go to task zero, and way two and three will go to task one. And then I also go to set one, way zero and one will go to task zero, and way two and three will go to task one. So inside each set, I partition the ways. So you either partition the sets or partition the ways. Good. So these are the two methodologies that exist right now. Let's start with way partitioning. Way partitioning exists in, well, Freescale is an old company that is purchased by NXP. It's one of the very common uh, companies for, uh, for automotive hardware. Uh, in fact, the FMU 660, you guys are using it. It was originally developed by Freescale, and then now NXP took it over. Um, so this, this way partitioning is used now by NXP and by Intel as well. If I have four ways in my cache, this is the coloring thing that we're discussing right now. So if you have within a set, you have four ways, you basically take one way and you have four cores, you take one way per core. So these are basically the colors here. Good. So for example, core one will access way one in all the sets. Core two will access way two in all the sets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. In Intel, this is called Intel architecture. This is called the cache allocation technology or CAT. Uh, and by the way, CAT is very used for well, quality of service or embedded like stuff, but also it's used for security purposes. Uh, it's called like the CAT, which is an Intel way partitioning mechanism. Um, well, here's some details of how the architecture really works. This is not what we care about. What we care about is the impact of this on performance. So how does this help us reduce really the interference between tasks? So this number, is, um, uh, this, this graph I'm really talking, taking from Intel themselves, what they do is they have taken applications. These are the applications we have on the right here. It's a very common set of benchmarks that is known for computer architecture. And then they run them together and they measure the slowdown, right? Slowdown means if you run in isolation, what is your running time? And then if you run in a multi-core interference scenario, you'd be slowed down by the cache access interference. And hence, you can find, for example, some applications have suffered a 4.5x slowdown in performance. So if you run in isolation in a thousand cycle, you are going to run in 4,000, what, 4,500 cycles in interference. It's a huge uh, slowdown due to interference, right? And they claim that this is basically because of cache interference. Once you apply your CAT technology, which is the way partitioning we're discussing, they found that most applications, in fact, go back again to, well, uh, a, a less source of interference. If you look into the numbers here, the geometric mean, or well, basically the average of, of, of contention is reduced to 1.25x, you still have huge variability. They, they say this is because of the main memory interference that they didn't address. But as you can see from the graphs, comparing this one to this one, you manage to shape the curve, slow down, or basically mitigate the interference access. Right? Questions? It's too much? Too complex? So you don't need to... One way is you need really to learn how to abstract. So you don't need to know all the details of this graph. But the idea is... This shape of the graph is telling me that, in fact, I'm being interfered a lot, right? So as you can see, well, there is a huge numbers here, and then most of them are really interfered. If I go down here, I manage to shape the interference to bring it down, right? That here, this is slow down, which means the less, the better, right? So with CAT technology, with cache partitioning, the interference became less, which is intuitive. Why? Because now I have my own partition. 
no one is evicting my cash lines, so I have a fast access time. Make sense? Is there any question? Okay. The problem with, with way partitioning is it requires hardware support. As I was telling you, Intel has a certain technology called CAT that enables you to do this, but not all architectures support way partitioning. ARM, for example, does not support way partitioning, which is ARM is basically the most common one in embedded systems. The other approach, which is set partitioning, is very easy to do because it does not require any hardware support. It can be done by the operating system. First of all, why it can be done by the operating system? For the notion I told you earlier, if you look into your address, I take my offset, and then I take the set index, and then this is the tag. If I manage that the operating system creates addresses such that the set index from one core always go to a certain set, for example, core zero will always create set index that go to set zero, core one will always go to set one, etc., etc., then I have done partitioning from the address itself. I didn't really touch the cache, right? The addressees themselves will be coming only to this set. Good. And as, as you can see from this figure compared to this figure here, way partitioning was you take way one in all the sets. These basically are the sets, and these are the ways. So one core is taking one way in all the sets. On the other hand, if you do set partitioning, if you do set partitioning, you basically you take Core one, for example, takes the whole set, which is set one, all the ways, right? Good. The way you do it is, as I was saying, from, from an operating system perspective, you take the physical address and you color the set index such that you create a set index that goes to a certain set by that core. And this is from an ARM Cortex A15, how it can be done. So again, it's a bit of a detail. And this is from an Intel, how it can be done. Yeah, static versus dynamic. Yeah, okay, let's finish this. So we discussed two ways of partitioning, static partitioning, dynamic partition. What we discussed so far is I assumed I can really partition my cache offline, static, right? So from the beginning, I know that core zero Let's talk about set partitioning, for example, will always access set zero. Core one will access set one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's good in terms of interference, but there is one very big problem with this, which is what if my task requires more data, more capacity than the partition that was assigned to me? What is going to happen? This is called overutilization. I, I would need to keep evicting my own lines, right? Because instead of having full access to the cache, I only get a part of it. So if my data layout is larger, this will really cause me a uh, performance degradation because not because of interference, which I solve it, but because of my requirements are much higher than I keep evicting my line. So in this, assume, for example, my cache is um, one megabyte, and then I have four tasks. Without, without partitioning, all the four tasks can access the full one megabyte. Correct, but with partitioning, each one will get 256 kilobytes. If a task has a data set that, for example, requires 512 kilobytes, what is going to happen? If you only give it 256 kilobytes, it will keep really evicting lines because you need to access data a lot, right? So this is called overutilization. There is, in fact, another problem with partitioning, which is for the exact same example. Maybe this is task zero. Task one, on the other hand, might only have a data set of two kilobytes. If you give it 256 kilobytes, this partition is being wasted, right? So it's called the underutilization. You give me a lot of data or data locations, but I really don't need them, right? So maybe one someone can say, okay, I still do static partitioning, but instead of assign the partitions equally, I assign the partitions based on the requirements of each task. Well, that's good, that's valid. That's in fact also common in industry. But the problem is that the task requirements of data sets change over time. So during one execution, think of, about a practical example. Like again, the airbag example we had in, in, a, in, in the card. It's not all the time while you execute, you access huge amount of data. Think about it, you sense, 
you collected the data, and then you need to transfer this sensitive data to the processor. But once you access this sensitive data to come up with a decision, the actuation itself does not require a huge amount of data, right? Because you have already taken the decision. So during different execution phases of the application or the task, your uh, data intensity will vary, right? And in that case, I really don't need to have this huge partition all the time or this small partition all the time, but I need to have a varying partition size based on what phase I'm in right now, right? Static partitioning does not allow this. So that's a problem with static partitioning. So static partitioning leads to either underutilization or um, or overutilization. I didn't discuss cache locking so far. Let me see. Yeah. So static partitioning, you assign the mapping statically. It's simple, it's good, but it's not ideal because you either do overutilization or underutilization. Dynamic partitioning, on the other hand, well, it's good because you can adapt to the changing behavior of different tasks, but the problem is it's very hard to do because you are telling me right now, I get a partition of, I get this set, and then after 100 cycle, I get another set. Does it mean that I need to migrate my data? What do you do for the old data that exists in that set for the other task, right? So dynamic partitioning is one of, it's very complex, and so it's not really very common in industry right now, even if it's, it's still one of the things that people try to investigate how to do efficiently to be able to adapt in industry. Good, so it's an open research problem, in fact. Good, good, a lot of information. So partitioning is one way. If you go back to the bigger picture, we said that we have three ways of, uh, of handling cache predictability in modern bl multiple platforms. Partitioning is one of them, and then there is locking, which is another one of them. The concept of cache locking is very simple. You say instead of having every cache line as is, I add one bit within a cache line. So assume that this is your cache. You add basically one bit here that you call a lock. Right? It's not one bit is, is a simplistic view, but simply you add a lock to that cache line. What was the original problem? The original problem is that as a task, if I have a cache line in a shared cache, Another task can evict my line, right? We said one way, partition it. Don't allow even this task to access it. But then partitioning has its own problems as we discussed. Looking is following a different approach. Looking is saying all tasks can access all the sets and all the ways, that's fine. But I add a capability, which I call cache looking. This is an ability for the task to say, look this cache line for me right now. Which means if there's another task that comes and try to evict this line, well, this allowed it. So you are not really evicted, right? So you add a lock, basically. Good. And then when I can evict it, when the task owner itself can really remove the lock. Good. The good thing about cache locking, it can address all sorts of interference, whether it's single core, multi core, uh, enter a task. It doesn't really matter. All of them can be accessed by cache locking. And I can do, again, way locking and line locking. It, it's a bit of a detail, but the, the, the big disadvantage of cache locking, it has to come from the architecture itself because you need to add bits and ability of a task to lock a line in the cache. It cannot be done through the operating system, for example, similar to set partition. Good. Okay. The last approach, which is also very common in gaming consoles, it's, it's common in GPUs and it's common in embedded systems. What we call, well, Cache is being hardware managed, not very easy to, to, to handle in terms of embedded systems. Instead of doing this, I use software managed memories, what we call scratch pads or SPMs. Uh, if you have a PS5 or, or, or any other gaming console, in fact, gaming consoles have a lot of scratch pads because it's also very good in terms of uh, graphic handling. You can think of a scratch pad as a programmable cache, something that the software can really say, bring this data right now, put it in the scratch pad, evict this data from the scratch pad. So it's not hardware managed. The software is responsible for loading or unloading the scratch pad. And the main idea is I can really uh, divide my memory into something that goes to the main memory and something that I want to put right now in the scratch pad. Well, this gives more control for the programmer, which means I can really analyze it easier. But the problem is you take the complexity from the hardware, you put it in the programmer shoulders, basically, right? 
So I need really to determine how do I load the data into the scratch pad? What data to load? Is this data important right now? And how to factor this in in my worst case execution time analysis, right? If you look, I promise you are done in a couple of minutes. I know it's too much. Um, but we want to finish this topic because maybe you can also quickly revisit it at the beginning of next lecture. But let's finish the whole idea such that you can you can study it alone if, if you would like. So the idea of having scratch bad in a processor is to do the following. I have a CPU. I divide my memory memory address space into my regular memory address space that is composed of a cache hierarchy and the main memory and the scratch pad. Scratch band is software managed and is very fast in terms of access times. One cycle, two cycle access time. And then this is something that I load and unload from it using programs. So there are instructions that tell you load right now, unload right now, right? This path is hardware managed, which means in the program you don't care about it. You don't know how even it's being handled. And this one is software managed. And the premise here is that if there is something you want to analyze, and bring in a very tight worst case latency, maybe use a scratch pad for this because you have a control and you can drive better bounds. If there is something that, well, it's okay to have some loose bounds, then you can really put it in the cache system and leverage the performance of the cache. If I compare caches to scratch pads, scratch pads are directly accessed or addressed by the software, but caches, I cannot really address them by the software. They are managed by the hardware. Uh, scratch pads are compact storage because they are software managed, so you don't need a lot of overhead storing the tags, the valid bits, the locks, all the things we discussed. The problem with scratch pad is it's not global addressing, uh, which means, well, it's part of the address space and it cannot really, you have to either access it or access the main memory. It cannot be used as part of the memory hierarchy. And it's not visible for the cache hierarchy, right? So uh, you need to add to, to, to basically handle it yourself in the program, which means it's not globally visible for the hardware. Good. If you were lost into all these details, so the summary is the following. Caches are very good in terms of average case performance because of the concept of locality and 1090 we discussed. It was very bad or problematic for predictability because it has a huge variability in terms of access time. That's the first concept you need to make sure of. Uh, they provide you optimistic performance, but not guaranteed one because you're not guaranteed whether you have a hit or a miss. It gives us three main sources of interference, intra-task, where a task evicts its own lines, inter-task, running on the same core, tasks evicting each other cache lines from the same core, or inter-core interference, tasks running in different cores. To be able to do this, we discuss three solutions. Well, we discussed four solutions. One of them is very naive, which is, well, don't use caches at all or assume everything is a mess. And we said it's not good for performance. Let's not do that. The second one is partitioning, where you say, well, I still have shared caches, but I partition the resource. We said there is set partitioning, way partitioning. And then we discussed locking, where there is no partitioning, but I put a lock in a line that I, it's critical to me. I don't want to evict right now as a task. And then finally, we said there is software managed caches or what we call scratch pads. Good. So that's basically the summary of all what we discussed. So let's stop here. Uh, you already have the slides. I will put the video such that you can really try to also consume these concepts. And maybe at the beginning of next lecture, I will ask you if you have questions and then maybe quickly revisit some of the concepts if it's too much. OK, thanks everyone. See you next week. I don't know.